I'm Jerry, and welcome to another episode of What's New at the Military Collectible Shop. It's been a while since we've been able to film one of these episodes. The winter has hit us pretty hard, along with most of the country. Um, but we've seen an enormous amount of snowfall and, and three snowblowers down. Things just haven't been going really well. So I haven't had a lot of extra time to do these kind of things. Um, but now, the sun's shining, the birds are singing, so we're going to get back on track. Because we've gotten in a lot of really great stuff that I want to share with you. So, let's take a look. One of the things we really like to see as collectors is when we get in what's called a grouping. Now, a grouping is a bunch of different items all to one service person. Uh, it can be photos, documents, the uniform, patches, but there's a personal connection. You know, a lot of times we'll get in loose patches or a jacket or something, and, and there's really no connection to, no direct connection to a person. So when we get in the groupings, it's kind of the exact opposite. There is a direct connection to the, per to the person. Um, one of the ones we just got in is a great grouping to a bombardier who, who actually flew with the Army Air Forces in World War II and was part of, among other things, the famous, famous Ploesti mission. Uh, so he flew aboard um, a B-24, and uh, he was part of a crew, and we were able to get a lot of photos, a lot of paperwork, uh, his medals, um, his wings, um, insignia, his squadron patch, a lot of, lot of, just a lot of items, you know, all that, that belong to or pertain to him. So it really helps tell the story. And because we can keep all this together, we can actually ensure that his memory of what he did, you know, lives on for future generations to see it. Where it's not just scattered to the wind or, or, or thrown away. You know, this is actually uh, one of his, um, you know, what they would call a blood shit. Um, where if they were if they were shot down, they would show this, and it's, it's in Arabic. They would show this to the local authorities, and that would you know give them um, like proof that they were an American and trying to help them. You know, help this person, give them money, give them food. Uh, if they're injured, contact the authorities. That that sort of thing. So they would carry this item when they were flying over different lands. This is this is actually his squadron patch. And in the, in the unit photo, you can see that they're actually wearing the squadron patches. However, the sensor had blurred them out. The intelligence sensor didn't want people to know exactly which squadron was doing what. But this is the squadron patch that he had worn. Um, but groupings like that are, are always uh, wonderful to find. We're, we're so happy whenever we find them. Um, and this week we had gotten in a couple of interesting groupings. One of the other groupings we recently got in is really kind of interesting. Uh, he had actually served in World War II as part of the U.S. Navy uh, Construction Battalion, or Seabees. So we got in, you know, several of his uniforms, hat, the, the so-called Donald Duck hat, um, little Seabees book, some other interesting souvenirs, um, some things he had brought back um, from Saipan, a whole box of scrapbooks and, and different souvenirs that he picked up. Um, but one of the more interesting things that we had found out is that he had actually served in 1917 or 1916 with the Canadian uh, Expeditionary Forces. And so he joined the Canadian Army. And one of the more interesting things from the grouping uh, included actually his uh, somewhat uh, rare, but mostly completely ineffectual, uh, early pattern gas mask. So gas was a new and horrific weapon of World War I. Um, when the Germans first used it, the Allies were completely unprepared for it, um, and it just had, had devastating results. So the Allies quickly tried to scramble with various um, types of things to uh, counter this, uh, the chlorine gas of, of the time, and, uh, you know, ranging from uh, a rag that you would soak and just put over your face to things that tried to protect your head and uh, from breathing in. This is actually impregnated with a, a type of chemical um, to help uh, combat the, uh, the penetration of the chlorine gas. Um, but they were not very widely um, liked by the Canadian troops um, and they only provided a little bit of protection. Uh, gas mass development quickly advanced um, as it needed to, um, and so 
two or three patterns later, we, we start seeing the gas masks of World War I that we're, we're all more familiar with. Um, but so this was an interesting part of a, you know, kind of an already interesting grouping. Um, you know, that, and it's unusual uh, to find, um, you know, someone with dual, du both dual war and dual country uh, servings. So that was kind of an interesting group uh, that we had picked up with a lot, a lot more um, little pieces and like I said, the scrapbooks and little personal touches to it. Uh, but again, it all tells the story. And if we were just able to get one of those pieces by itself, we wouldn't have this full story of, of this soldier that served. So again, now we're gonna be able to research this guy and uh, put our research documents uh, together with it and keep this story going for decades and you know, hopefully centuries to come. Okay, and then one of the um, last groups that I'll show you that we got in this week, um, really, really cool and really extensive grouping uh, to an officer who served in World War II and then went on to continue serving. Um, so this was a, a very extensive grouping. We ended up with a lot of uniforms from him. Um, most of them had the complete ribbon bars um, and some interesting... Um, some interesting other is the mess dress jacket with the, the bullion armored insignia. Um, just a lot of a lot of nice uniform, nice uniform bits. But again, part of his story um, is that he was actually awarded the Bronze Star. And um, not only do we have the Bronze Star, but we also have the newspaper article that, that talks about it. Which again ties ties it all together it is that provenant provenantial thread that ties everything together. He was also awarded uh, the Legion of Merit uh, for his services, a nice high high American award. Um, but one of the more interesting things about this group is in in World War II, he was the uh, the intelligence um, uh, commander uh, for the hundred. 102nd Division, um, and he was actually awarded the the Order of the Red Star um, by the Russians, which was kind of an unusual uh, order. It happened, um, but it didn't happen all that frequently. Um, he was also awarded uh, the uh, the French Croix de Guerre um, by the by the French um, as well for his services. Um, so he was he was highly thought after, but a, a real nice group with a lot of um, you know being an officer um, We've got a lot of his we've got his his miniature metal racks, and we've got some of his theater made uh, ribbon bars uh, some of his officer insignia from his time in World War II. Um, he went on um, To then serve later on uh, As part of the first army um, but while in Germany, he did bring back some souvenirs. We did get a, a German rifle scope um, from him and some other, some bayonets. Um, interestingly enough, a Japanese bayonet. So uh, I'm not sure um, when he might have gotten over to Japan or if he just knew somebody. Um, sometimes these things just have a way of getting together. Maybe he had brothers who served or family members who served uh, over in the Pacific. Well, we got in some other German bayonets and uh, his American bayonets and things. Um, so a very extensive uh, grouping. Uh, again, all to to one guy. You know, we've got some pictures of him. Uh, hopefully, the, the family is sending us some more pictures um, to keep with this um, because they they understand the value of the grouping. And a lot of times, people ask us, they're like, "How can you buy those those medals? Those should stay with the family." Well, in a lot of cases, there is no family left. So, you know, people's options aren't as open as, as people would like to think. A lot of times museums don't want this kind of stuff. Uh, they just have so much of it, it's not gonna be put out. Um, you know, it's just, there's too much extra stuff. They don't have storage space for all of this. Um, and, you know, you don't want this, this stuff ending up at the local Goodwill, you know, for kids running around in Halloween. So, um, that's when we become you know, a viable option. You know, collectors are really the preservers of history. Every collector is pretty much a closeted museum curator and strives to collect, uh, protect, and ensure that these items are gonna live on for future generations. So, 
Um, all right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this little episode of Groupings, um, brought to you by the What's New at the Military Collectible Shop series. I'm Jerry. I hope to see you here, and if I can't see you here or at shows, I hope to see you online. Visit us at our website at militarycollectorshq.com, and take care. Stay safe, everybody. And I wanted to kind of give you a smattering of of the. Three, two, one. It's been a while since we've been able to share with you. Ah. Wow. Take four. Three, two, one. It's been a while since we've been able. Pa 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 pa. Be a professional, be a professional like me!